Hello, friends. Welcome to Organic Sound Select Guitars. Thank you so much for joining us here on a Wednesday evening. I know it's not easy to get out here and fight Southern California traffic always in the middle of the week. Uh, we sure appreciate seeing you all here. And a big thank you to whoever's out there virtually. We're live streaming, so thank you for joining us. Um, really glad to have you here. We're so excited to have the Hudson Dalton Guitar Company here to speak with us today. They make some of the best guitars in the world, and they're some of the nicest people you're ever going to meet. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Kimberly Dalton and Mark Dalton, Brian Dickel, Mr. Scott Four, who's going to entertain us tonight. And please, let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, folks. Hey, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. It's so wonderful to see some familiar faces with names, finally connect, make the connection. Um, appreciate it a lot. So for those of you that may not know, I'll just give you a brief little background on Huss and Dalton Guitar Company. October 1st will be our 28th anniversary. Um, somewhere around our 30th anniversary, I'm hoping that Mark and I can retire, maybe. <laughs> Uh, we're planning to get Brian Dickel well-versed in especially my job, which is, you know, books and boring marketing and all that fun stuff. He's a great builder, and he's been building for a long time. He worked for us for about 11 years or so, 10 years or so ago. And Jeff Hust had been threatening to <laughs> retire uh, for several years, and he did in May of 21. And Brian bought his half of the business. And it's been a win-win. Jeff and his wife, his wife retired too, and they've been on the road, keeping the road well-versed. They're in Tahiti right now as we speak. <laughs> Hello, husbands, if you're tuning in. And uh, it's been a win-win with, with Brian being on board. And he's brought some youth to Mark and I <laughs> and some good ideas and um, it's been fun, and we're looking forward to some, you know, fun years ahead still. Um, we're in Stanton, Virginia. If you've not been to Virginia, to the Shenandoah Valley, I encourage you to come visit. It's really beautiful. And I guess at this point, we'll just kind of have a casual chat session. Yeah. And we'll then open up the floor to questions that you may have. Scott Four is going to do some great flat picking for us. And, and finger picking. And I said flat picking. Yeah, that too. Well, he's a flat pick king. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. We know the traffic can be fun here. <laughs> you know, we're about three miles away, and it took us – 25 minutes we went yeah. around and round and well and that and that was with gps and that was with gps two of them okay <laughs> yeah. i'm driving two i'm driving and we've got two we had, google maps we had three navigators and two gps units and it only took about 20 minutes longer than it should have exactly <laughs> that's what happens when country folks come exactly. to town so you know <laughs> All right, so we don't I have that we'll problem just, in the Shenandoah uh, Valley. So, yeah, we're just going to do something real informal. Um, if you have questions at any point, uh, holler them out or raise your hand or write them on the back of a $100 bill and we'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we talked about doing is we'll just we'll talk a, bit, a, a little bit about it, each of our uh, roles in the business. And then every once in a while, we'll let Scott play a little. We'll do a little technical stuff, too. And, um, yeah, and we're not going to bore you to death with that or hopefully anything else. Uh, but I guess what I, I would like to start is with Brian. Because um, uh, like Kim said, um, Brian was with us for about 10 years or 11 years, and then... Then he was not for 10 years, and um, it's a lot better with him around than it is when he's not, <laughs> I can tell you that, because it was a pretty dark day the day I, th I found out he was going to leave. 
Uh, but he wanted to play music, and you know that's what we all that's what we're all about, right? I mean, we we all love music. That's why we're here. And Brian had a good opportunity. He he got a band. I mean, he was instrumental, uh, pardon the pun, in getting uh, the band The Steel Wheels off the ground, and they're still a, a very successful Americana act. Google them up; they're great. Yeah, and um, but anyway. We saw Brian early. Jeff Huss and I said, you know, Brian's the guy, right? Because we knew at some point uh, there would be a succession, as there always is. Um, and we said, Brian's the guy. Well, then we lost Brian for a while, and we searched for 10 more years to find out who the guy was. Turns out he was the guy all along. Yeah, all along. Um, because not to make light of COVID, because it was serious, but it did... It was the reason why Brian was able to come back. I mean, it sort of brought him back. So, anyway, I'm going to introduce you to Brian. Let him talk a little bit and tell him about, uh, tell you um, his side of the Huss and Dalton story. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. So, like you said, I was on the road for ten <laughs> plus years uh, playing music full time. So it was kind of an adventure. I got to see all over the world and and played a lot of shows and some good parts and bad parts and. And then COVID hit and completely shut down the industry to a grinding halt. So there's some moments of panic and trying to figure out what in the world's going to happen. And, you know, I remember coming home. My wife, Mary Beth, is with me tonight. And coming home from that, and it was like, I, I guess we're going to be home for two weeks. I'll, we'll figure something out. And, you know, two weeks turned into a whole lot longer than two weeks. But oh, boy, did it. kept running into Jeff Huss and his wife, Diane, downtown, Stanton with nothing to do. And we'd have a glass of wine talk about it and then he said well why don't you come into the shop and I thought well okay they, they just need some part-time work and I've got absolutely nothing to do I built a deck on the house and painted the neighbor's fence and at that point I'd pretty much canvassed the neighborhood for any odd job I had so <laughs> oh yeah I'd put crown mold in Mary Beth's mom's house you know you name it I, I figured out how to do it during that time <laughs> so I thought I was coming in for a little part-time interview and instead it was uh you want to buy my half of the business? And initially, I did say no because I was like, I thought about it, and I was like, well, the band's still in theory a thing. It's just I don't know when it's going to happen again. And that was still, you know, I'd poured my last 10, 15 years into that. So, but then I came in and did start working a few part time hours, and it was it was fun to get back into it. You know, and I'd had 10 years off, but the skills were still there and the passion was still there and I still loved music and guitars and woodworking and all the things that drew me there the first time. And, you know, then it looked like, well, we got like three gigs on the books, which might have, you know, that was huge. Going from 120 a year to three felt like, well, we're making progress. And then I know Mark had a, a talk with Jeff and said, why don't you, you need to talk to Brian one more time. And, and before life resumes again and just see, see where he's at. And and I thought about that one real hard when he came back a second time. It took me about a month or so, and and Mary Beth and I were getting married at the same time, so it was like let's just throw all the life changes all the all at once. It's a big year. Yeah, it was a big year. A big year. Not recommended to do all those things at the same time, but that's just how life works sometimes. And, and I thought about that one, and I did I did and say yes to that, and it felt good. I'd known Mark and Kim for since 2000 when I started yeah. there, so yeah, we'd already had 20 some years together, and. And had remained good friends throughout all that, and yeah, never burn, never burn your bridges on the way out the door, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and he knew what he was getting into. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. I knew the business, you yeah, know. It wasn't easy, and yeah. So yeah, go from one obscure career to another. That was kind of what I've done my whole life. So it, it, it's been a good fit though, and and super happy to have Mark and Kim around, and and you know, it wasn't just throwing me to the to the wolves. You know, I, I understand some parts of business, but there's other parts that I, I'm still learning. So it's been really a, a nice transition into there. And so I basically assumed Jeff Huss's role. It was kind of funny for a while, for about six months, Jeff was actually my employee. We, we retained him. Yeah. <laughs> and we just switched roles, basically. And he, he went on to train me in a couple of things that I hadn't done for a, a quite a few years. A punch card. Yeah, he had, to, he had to clock in and everything. We, oh we sent. That was so he was like, "You're making me clock in." I'm like, "Yep, Jeff, you got to like, clock no, in now." <laughs> so yeah, we we had we had him around for a little bit. So that was a nice way to transition into it. And so I'm I'm carving all the necks. Um, we have a CNC machine, which we can talk about later. But that uh, 
only gets you some rough parts, so we're still hand shaping everything to whatever spec people want. Um, doing that, kind of the final wood fitting transition, getting the angles of everything, making sure everything's perfect before it goes over to the finish room. Um, so that's that's kind of my role in the company at this point, and then of course all the other behind the scenes stuff, emails and phone calls and all that stuff. But that's the you know the basic idea of where I'm at, and yeah, like they they had alluded to. And by year 30, the plans are to transition out of that, and I will become both the Huss and the Dalton. <laughs> so, no, but, we're not changing the name to nope. Michael and Dalton. That's, no. that's part of what I'm buying into is the, the legacy yeah. of Huss and Dalton. So that will never change. My name is on the label now if you can read my signature. But other than that, exactly. that's where I show up on the guitar. So I think, I think it's important for a business like ours that's been around now going on 28 years. You've got to have... You got to stay fresh. You got to stay fresh somehow or another. You have to have fresh ideas uh, and a fresh enthusiasm. I mean, I still love my job, um, and I, I still love guitars, but to really stay fresh. Okay, sorry. For for things to um, progress. You know, a, a business that gets stagnant just dies. I mean, that's all there is to it. And, it, and it, it's really easy <clears throat> after a few decades go by to get stagnant. Even if you still love your job, it's easier just to go in there and build the same thing over and over again, you know, um, and say, we already know how to do that. That's easier. We can sell them. Let's just do that. You know, so part of the thing that Brian's bringing to first is he's a little younger <laughs> He's he's not drastically younger. But, uh, I'll take it where I can get it. Then. Yeah, he, he's right, much younger. He's, <laughs> not drastically. He's a little he's a little younger, so he has, you know how there's a, a also a transition between generations, and so you, you some of you people have kids that are probably approaching Brian's age, where they're, you know, Brian's like forty seven or something yeah. like that. So uh, you probably some of you have thirty to forty year old kids and. There's there's a freshness to things, not just technology, but ideas about, in particular, guitars. And now that we're into electric guitars, we really need that to be a part of it. We need um, that, and so that's another great thing that he's bringing. Uh, one thing we're going to do is let Mr. Scott Four play a little for you. And so I'll tell you who Scott is. We're from the same neck of the woods uh, up in central and southwest Virginia. They're south. I'm more of a hillbilly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I was giving you credit for the South Boston part, which is uh, oh, yeah. where, well, where your dad I'm, lived. I'm from further out in the hills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Scott's from southwest Virginia and uh, and grew up playing guitar. We, we actually talked one time about, so, you know, when we were kids at home, you know, we grew up in the country and on farms and stuff, and there, there was not a lot to do. And so, to do to do anything constructive with your time, music was one thing you know that grabbed us. And, and in that part of the world, you have to work pretty hard to avoid it. You know, it's pretty much everywhere. And so, we're, Scott and I were talking one time, and uh, Scott's a few years older than me, but not a lot. But we were talking about a, a Doc and Merle Watson concert at the Roanoke Civic Center, which was in 1979. I told Scott, I said, I was already playing before that, <clears throat> but that thing grabbed me. You know, I, I went to see Doc and it was like, holy cow, that's a whole other thing. You know, and I'd heard Doc, but to see him live and I actually got to meet Doc that night and, and Merle, it was like a, it was a whole other thing. And Scott said, oh yeah, I was there. You know, so we, we didn't know each other at the time. <laughs> And I was 16, and Scott would have been whatever, but we... You're uh, the guy that spilled <laughs> that Coke on me that night. Yeah, I probably. <laughs> but anyway, that you know, that music will grip you, and, and that night was a, a really special thing. I don't know that... I saw Doc many times after that, because Merle Fest is, is a thing in, in Western North Carolina that we've been to. I think I went 16 years in a row to see uh, that. Great festival. Still is. Yeah, terrific. Well, and Doc Doc lives around or grew up around where I live, so you know right. we'd see him all the time, at picking parties and stuff at people's houses. Right. So it wasn't, you know, it's not like it's just like your neighbor. 
everybody plays that's music, true. you know. So ain't, the, nothing, ain't nothing else to do in the hills. Man. No, that's, that's yeah, we benefit from boredom in that way. Uh, <laughs> but, Scott, you know, the, the Winfield National Flat Pick Championship in Winfield, Kansas, is the, you know, sort of the definitive um, uh, championship for flat pick and fingerstyle guitar and all other, you know, folk instruments. And Scott is two-time champion, flat pick champion of the Winfield uh, Flat Pick Championship. <laughs> Uh, and so when you win it you, you have to lay out is it five years five years yeah you can't you can't enter again for five years so uh, <clears throat> maybe next year scott is just now uh getting past his five-year hiatus where he couldn't go back and compete so uh, he may be three times so we, we we're rooting for him anyway well, i've won most of the contests multiple times yeah so, so anyway, lucky. no, <laughs> um, so we're just going to let Scott play you one. Y'all, you know, think of some, any questions you might have and we'll, we'll answer them whenever you get to them. So, and back home people would dance Yeah. when, when you play <laughs> any flat footers or cloggers in here. There's a little space up here. So <laughs> there might be moonshine involved too. So. <laughs> Which helps with the dancing. Mm, definitely. So anyway, here's here's one I worked up. This is an an old time fiddle tune, and I worked it up, you know, for solo guitar, and kind of put some like Stephen Stills kind of stuff in it and stuff like that. So it's a tune called Angeline the Baker. <laughs>
Thanks, God. It's so terrific. Scott. Larry, you have a question? Okay. Sure. Just so I can be heard. <laughs> Hello again, folks. Um, here's my question. You know, I saw a lot of really nice instruments here um, and a lot of nice brands, and I, and I love Hudson Dalton guitars. To me, they tend to have a gutsiness and soulfulness and blueful, bluesiness that just attracts me to them, and they're beautiful builds and beautiful woods. And I guess my question is, what is your what is your goal when you're building these instruments? What are you trying to obtain? What are you trying to get to? What's your philosophy of building? What are you after? Hmm. That's a big question. I know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to answer it first. Yeah, we got Kim on that one. To sell it. <laughs> 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 well, so I'm I'm marketing and books and you know the kind of the boring stuff on the business side. So, um, but I also do sales. So I work with our wonderful dealers such as Larry on a you know almost daily basis. We've got um, we don't sell direct, so we have a network of dealers in the U.S. Maybe I don't know close to. 40, 50 dealers. Uh, we've got a handful of international dealers and a German distributor and a UK distributor. So um, guitars that we build are going all over the world. Um, we do mainly custom builds. So when Larry and I talk, um, he's got some ideas about what he wants. He knows his customer base. He knows what they like. He knows what woods he likes. And part of my job also is mainly I do a lot of the wood purchasing. And when the woods come in, I take photos, send them out to Larry and the team, dealer, the dealers. Um, so it, 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 a lot of that philosophy comes from what you want and what you know your customer base wants. Um, and then the philosophy then kicks in for you guys because yeah. I do not build. I am not a builder whatsoever. I do not play. Uh, I'm the only one in the shop. All the other guys, and we have a great team of luthiers back home, and uh, they they all play music of some genre. And uh, you know they're they're super super great guys, and we're very proud of them. So and they also input. They give us input and ideas and. Um, you know, we listen and take it and run and pass it by the dealers and move on with whatever the custom build is. Um, the, so, yeah. yeah, there you go. <clears throat> okay. On the, uh, without getting too technical, because that stuff can get so dry, unless that's, unless that's what you want, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna dwell on it because I bore myself to death talking about it myself. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> we, we did bring a top, um, just to show, of course, you know, the scalloped X brace is uh, is not a reinvention of the wheel. Um, this is just our version of it. We we all do it. Um, and we were just up at the show, setting up for the show, and uh, Steve McCreary from Collings and, and Richard Hoover and I and Brian were standing there talking. And, and uh, we, we have a lot of respect for those guys and what they do because they're, they're great at it. And... Um, We've learned a lot from them. Hopefully, maybe they learn a little something from us over the years. I don't know, but um, none of us has reinvented this. This is was done a long time ago before we came along. Everybody has their take on it, and oddly enough, you don't have to change it a whole lot to to get a little signature sound out of it. Um, everything that you do changes it a little bit in some way. For us, uh, we use Appalachian Red Spruce as the bracing on everything. Uh, we always have. We're real close to where Appalachian Red Spruce grows. Um, it does not grow below 4,000 feet elevation, but over in the Blue Ridge, just west of us, one county over, it does grow. Um, so we've always thought of that as our brace wood. It is stronger by weight than any other spruce, and so it can be thinned a little bit without compromising the strength of the top. Um, we like Honduran rosewood for our bridge plate. Honduran rosewood is extremely hard, dense, um, 
really, really resonant. If you pick up a piece of it and and you tap it, it it will ring. You know, marimba keys are are made of Honduran rosewood. I mean, they always were. I don't. It's a little more scarce now, and I assume they're going for some synthetic things probably. But um, our idea with bridge plate, and everybody has their own. I know there are guys who do maple and and smaller uh, maple plates. Our idea is that the Honduran rosewood disperses the vibration. We don't want the vibration to die in the top. We want it to disperse, uh, and nothing is more resonant than, than this wood. Uh, it also resists the string ball uh, tearing into it over the years. It's really hard, and so the string ball won't tear it up to where you have to replace it uh, nearly as much. Um, other than that, it's a scallop forward X on everything. We do the, uh, so we do a 25 foot radius on the tops. We have the traditional series and the crossroads and those have a flat top uh, in the traditional build. The radius is built into the, the bracing but then the top is forced down onto the flat sides. Uh, that gives one sort of signature tone to the, the, the T model uh, guitars that, you know, the Tom OMs and the Tom Dreadnoughts and the crossroads but everything else, if it doesn't have either one of those designations, it has a 25-foot radius to the whole thing. We put the sides up in a 25-foot radius. And the idea there is that you can make that surface stronger without making it heavier. Um, if you ever drive down a road beside a, a, a tractor and trailer that with a, that's pulling a, a flatbed that's empty, if you look at it, they're, they're arched. Right, and that's the reason why they're they're stronger that way, without having to make it so heavy that it's you know adds diesel fuel that that guy's got to spend to go down the road. Um, same thing here. The only thing about it is you get a you get a really nice boost to the mid range, and we really like that, and it cuts a mic just terrific. But not everybody wants that sound. Some people want that growl of the traditional flat top. And so those two series, the T-series and the Crossroads, give you that. So you got anything to add to that, Brian? Yeah, I think w one of the hardest things to do is do it consistently then. You know, everybody can make a pretty good sounding guitar at least once, but then how do you do it 5,000 times? Or we're coming up on 6,000 here real soon. And so part of, part of what we do with that is, is trying to, you know, we build things with very specific jigs that we've come up with over the years. And we also tune our tops through a deflection process, um, which is basically adding a weight to the top. And you can, not to bore like Mark said, but it, it, it pushes the top down and up and we have a set of numbers that don't really mean anything other than to us because we know how much that weight is supposed to deflect a top and we'll, we'll tune the top until it gets into that. And I think that really helps keep us consistent from guitar to guitar. And then each one has a different flavor. You know, like Kim said, we, we use all kinds of exotic woods and different things. They're all still in the Huss and Dalton tonal family when the guitar is built, but they get little flavor additives, which is kind of cool. We, we have fun with it, too. It's, it energizes us and keeps us going. It's like, oh, this never built with this wood before, but let's see what happens. And sometimes you end up with a super magical. I think I've always told everybody almost every, well, actually everything that we send out the door, we're, we're proud of and sounds great. And every now and then some of them sound phenomenally exceptional and you don't even know exactly why but that's kind of the magic and fun for us as well um you never get a bad product out of it but every now and then you get that magical combination so we try to repeat that as much as we can yep sure oh now i don't want to ask it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry um you said and just like any business and most of us have been in some kind of business even if it's just raising children or what have you innovate or die so I was wondering, what are some of the innovations that you have come up with over the years to keep things fresh? Is it just expanding into electric guitars, or is it some kind of a different breed of acoustic guitar? Well, the, I'll tell you, um, the, the acoustic guitar is a really traditional instrument. So uh, if you... Now, there are some people who who start off with real innovative avant-garde sort of designs and they're able to keep going down that road. Us being from 
uh, Central Virginia, you know, we're expected to be more traditional. And we started off that way. We started off with a love of the old Martins and Gibsons, you know, so we built those first. Then over the years, we built different models. But uh, you are kind of pigeonholed into um, that. And you can come up with something like we have an, uh, a Model FS, which is geared at modern finger style, <clears throat> which we think is terrific. But we're sort of seen as being these guys live in dreadnought country, so they're going to be they're going to build the world. yeah they're going to build great dreadnoughts, but they probably don't know anything about our modern finger style guitar. So we we love to work around the edges of that sort of thing, but you can't plow right down the middle of it uh, because it's hard to be successful. Now the electrics got to be my baby about two or three years ago because we looked around and said you know. Um, we, we have all of these acoustic models. The electric guitar world is almost half of the total guitar market. So why not build some electrics? You know, I was a big fan of, I loved the, for me, it was the old Southern rock, you know, Allman Brothers, the guys who, who played Les Pauls. That, that was the, the humbucker sound was what was in my head as what I liked about electric guitar tone. So I said, I'm just going to, I'm going to build one, you know, I'm going to build one and see how it comes out and see if we can sell a few of them. So, yes, right now, uh, Innovator Die is going to the electric side for us, um, mostly because, not that we've done all you can do in acoustic guitars, but it is, it's, it's bound by tradition more, I think, than the electric side is. Yeah. I have uh, three questions. Uh, <laughs> the first one might be really naive. First of all, thank you very much for coming. I find this really interesting. Um, does the sound that comes out of a guitar change over the life of a guitar? Does it like mature or something like that? Uh, number question, question number two, how many hours does it take a craftsman to build a guitar? And they are craftsmen, right? They're all craftsmen, not just workers. Yeah. Sure. And the third question is, other than steel wheels, what famous people play your guitars? <laughs> You want to grab those? Bro. Yeah. What was the first question? Was yeah, most definitely. Uh, they'll they really change. I feel a lot in the very beginning. Like Mark does most all of our final setups these days, and like even we'll hang one up and go to lunch and come back, and they'll change in an hour. Those first few hours do change a lot, just setup wise and tonal wise. Um, you're always trying to make it a little. You know, you're trying to advance that process so you don't have to wait 50 to 100 years to get that sound you're after. And I think the some of the uh, thermocured, torrified tops have started to... It's one innovation in our business that has kind of increased that, fast-forwarded that process a little bit. Um, other than that, yeah, part of the fun is owning one for 15, 20 years, and, and it does mature and kind of fall, you know... It kind of grows with you as a player, I think, even, or... It, your ear starts to develop with it, like that's the sound I want, and that's my, that's my main guitar. That's what I want every guitar to sound like. Um, but yeah, they definitely, most definitely, change quite a bit. Uh, question two. We haven't done a time study lately. We we build in very small batches, so we we're kind of like four, four to five guitars a week, is what we're we're kind of developing through, and it's about a two month process from start to finish. Maybe forty hours or more. I would, I would yeah, I would say at We've least. We've always that. said about sixteen. Yeah, depends. The, the newer the employee, the more hours you put in. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been living so, through sometimes that. Sometimes we do about eighty hours into a guitar, you know. But depends on which time you mean that we built it. The first, <laughs> second, or third time. I yeah, think. yeah. Things, things, things don't leave until we're satisfied. So you know, it it, it can be a real frustrating process at times. And it's wood. Yeah. It's wood. Yeah. It's wood. It, nothing wood. makes you cry more than a really nice set of sides cracking in the side bender, you know. And wood. you can't help that sometimes. Really yeah. The guitar, you know, yeah, like well, like what they're saying, we're working with wood and and you you know, this is how thick this top is. Um and it's got to hold 180 some pound, at, you know, medium gauge at um at long scale, it's 180 some pounds of, of pressure on this top, so it it really has to be strong. But if you make it too strong, it won't sound like anything. So it's a real delicate balance. 
I think the last time we did any kind of time study, we were at 50 to 60 hours, yeah. which I'm kind of ashamed to say because <laughs> some of the, you know, like Taylor makes a really nice guitar and, you know, a third that time, I would say, you know. So, yeah. But that's just the economy of scale that they have going for them that we don't. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the deflection test. I'll tell you a funny story about it. Um, Which Jeff Huss and Mark Dalton created. Yeah, I would like, I, that was part of it, was I thought we created it anyway. <clears throat> uh, I, was trying to, I was trying to come up with some way. When I started, I was trying to tap and listen to tops. And to be honest with you, I never could make sense of it. Now, people that I respect a lot, like Richard Hoover and Dana Bourgeois and those guys, they do it. Um, and I won't sit here and tell you that it doesn't exist because those guys, like I say, I have the greatest respect for their work. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't make it make sense for me. And I tried a strobe tuner on the thing. Jeff Huss had an old, one of those old ancient orchestral strobe tuners, which <laughs> would hear you know, a pin drop out in the parking lot <laughs> and it wouldn't hear a note coming out of that top. And I was real frustrated with it early on. And I said, I've got to have some way <clears throat> that we know this is going to hold up over time because we were putting this thing out here with a lifetime warranty on it. And so I'm not sleeping on, you know, this holding up for the rest of my career uh, without some way to test it. And so I decided that it was all in the stiffness. And... um so I made this jig that suspends the top on four points. And so you put a weight in it, and it, it simulates the string tension on the bridge plate. The weight goes roughly where the bridge plate is. And then we thickness the top accordingly. We came up with a standard of how much that should bend under that weight. Now, my version of this jig was this really crude thing <laughs> made out of plywood and two-by-fours. And the weight was a box that I made that was for, full of bird shot, right? So, and it had a dowel stick. Well, it worked, okay, it was fine. And uh, I figured out, you know, how much uh, that thing should deflect. And I started noticing that I could count on the tone as well as the fact that it would hold up. I was like, we're more consistent than we were. So this is, I'm onto something here, which I thought I had invented. And then I found out that some, you know, one of the old Spanish guys a hundred years ago had a can of beans that he used <laughs> and he had a cabinet scraper instead of a thickness sander, but you know, I didn't invent anything. Somebody had already done it. Uh, but the worst day of my life was one day when I dropped the box on the floor and the bird shot went all over the shop. <laughs> and even worse was I realized I didn't know what it weighed before it fell on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I called Huss in there. I said, man, we're in trouble because <laughs> this is all over the floor and I, there's no way we're going to get all these BBs off the floor and I don't know what it weighed. So the only thing to do was to backtrack, was to get more birdshot, put it back together, and then take some tops that we already knew what the deflection was on and you know reverse engineer that thing until, it, until it, we said, okay, that's how much it weighed. So then John Calkin, who was a great builder who worked for us for about 20 years, he was a former gunsmith. And so he got a buddy of his to make a really slick version of it that has weights and its bearings and, it, and it's uh, made out of aluminum and stuff. And it, it works terrific. So anyway. And, and yeah, the, the nice part about that that I, I appreciate too is like, like Mark said, we don't discount that, you know, a, a really skilled builder can hear a note and they know how to tune it, but that involves that person. They're the only one that can do that. Whereas this is not foolproof, but once you train somebody on it, we don't have to have either Mark or myself or whoever has, we don't have to be in the shop making a great guitar. We, we can have a, a skilled employee doing that for us and it's repeatable. So yeah, that's from the engineering side of things that, that makes us very consistent, I feel. And we've kept the data on every, every yeah, there's a little notebook, hand scrawled with a bunch of numbers in it that probably means you have a nothing. Question mark? I do. Thank you. We didn't answer his third oh. question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Famous. Famous people. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, 
We get that question a lot, of course. Uh, it's always a little tricky because we don't do direct sales. So sometimes we find out in a roundabout way, or all of a sudden you're like on TV, and you're like, oh, that guy, that's playing a Huston Dalton or whatever. But we have Bob Weir owns one from the Grateful Dead. Uh, Mary Chapin. Mary Chapin Carpenter has had a few. Um, Albert Lee has <laughs> signature models. And Albert will be around for the, for the next couple of days at the yeah, show, he's too. He's going to be yeah, at our booth. If yeah. you're if you're interested and can get in the show anyway, come up and, and meet Albert. Yeah, Drew Holcomb. I mean, there's it's been a variety of people over the years that yeah. a lot of the a lot of it for us is the guitar player, for somebody famous who you've never heard of the guitar player, but you've heard of you've heard of Madonna, but you've not heard of Monty Pittman, who's Madonna's guitar player. Justin Derrico with Pink, who is also on The Voice, uh, who's from Charlottesville, Virginia, real near us. Yeah. But he lives here now, of course. Yeah. Mostly to the um, voice, voice band in the background. Yeah. Um, Edie Bukel. Yeah. Edie. Yeah. Paul Simon. Paul yeah. Simon. He's married to her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, we've had a little of that over the years. So that's not really how we've ever tried to market our guitars, and we're. You know, there's nothing that would mortify me more than going backstage at some show holding a couple of guitars trying to tell some famous person who I am. You know, it's just not, I mean, it's not my personality. But we've been lucky enough that they've bought a few of them over the years. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we, yeah. Uh, James Allen Shelton. Yeah. George Shuffler. In the Bluegrass World. Scott Fuller. Scott's got a, a song yeah. he's going to do. Sure. Yeah, pick one, yeah, Scott. Yeah, I can do that. To James. Pick one, Scott. We lost both of them. They were James was a wonderful front player. Does anybody know who James Allen and George Shuffler are? If James Allen Shelton. They George is the guy that kind of basically invented cross picking on the guitar, which is you know that kind of playing because before flat picking, everybody played with a finger pick or a thumb pick. So, you know, uh, Lester Flatt and Carter Stanley and all that, Maybell Carter and all those, they, they did all that. When you hear the Wildwood Flower, Maybell's playing with the thumb pick, finger picks. So it's not flat picking, even though a lot of flat pickers learned to play the song. The first song, it was actually originally done with thumb picks and finger picks. And what George did in the Stanley Brothers was get that sound you know with a, with a flat pick or a straight pick or just a regular guitar pick as most people call it today so that, that's who those yeah go ahead pick one all right well let's try this <laughs> <laughs> I'm renting mule today. <laughs> uh, anyway, here's here's an old Stanley Brothers song I'll try, and uh, this was re released by the Stanleys in 1950. It's called "The Fields Have Turned Brown." <laughs> Left my old home Ramble this country My mother and dad Said son don't go home Remember that 
Thank you. So my question, building on questions before and the answers, there's a business side and the art slash music side. And Kim says, I buy the wood. Well, you gentlemen work that wood in these phenomenal instruments, and I'm grateful I own two of them. So my question is, how do you find, how do you choose the wood that Kim buys, and how do you know you got what you want? She she chooses a lot of it now. The exotic stuff, Kim has got her her ear to the ground, her nose to the ground. Yeah, my people. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, we'll we'll grade everything after it gets in. Um, she's gotten really good at at finding some really terrific stuff. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, Appreciate that. She's always, I'm sorry, I forgot we're supposed to be using the mic. Um, she's always looking, she's always looking for wood and she'll, uh, she'll find a, you know, three or four sets of something. We're small, you know, it doesn't take, doesn't take much to get us excited. We find three or four sets of something nice and she'll say, but she'll often go to Brian or I and say, you know, is this quarter sawn enough? Is this, you know, this set of, this back is off quarter, but the sides are quartered. Is this going to work? You know, th that technical part. Yeah. Not just Brian or I, though, you know, Dean Jones has been with us 18 years. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Dean Bill's bodies, he knows wood and she can call on us. So. And a lot of what I learned, <laughs> a lot of what I learned with wood came from Jeff Huss and my husband because Jeff was the wood guy. Um, he's, uh, he's always bought our woods and, and I started kind of shadowing him long ago and learned a lot about different woods and what this sounds like and what that sounds like. And, um, it's a real interesting part of my job. I like it a lot. Uh, we have some wonderful vendors that we work with. Just some really awesome guys and gals. Yes, there are some women in this industry. Yay, right? Wonderful women. Um, and yeah, I mean, just, you know, when, I'm, when we're looking for something, if, you know, when our dealers want some African blackwood, okay, let me see what I can hunt up for you. And um, call up my vendors and see what we've got. And usually photos are involved first, not always. Um, a lot of times they'll just ship it to us and say, if you like it, keep it, pay for it. If you don't, send it back. Um, that's one beauty of being small because I think the big, big guys maybe cannot do that as easy as we can. So, yeah. Works. That was uh, one of the questions about in innovation. One of the things that's changed a lot in the the, uh, the years that I've been doing this is that there's way more acceptance for a lot of different species of wood that we never built out of 25 years ago. Um, that's yeah, that's turned around a lot. Um, yeah, there's a Paduk uh, guitar here. This DS12. Um, and leopard wood. Yeah, no, that's that one's not. I'm that's uh, oh, we've got leopard wood up here. Yeah. Oh no, this is these these wing mahogany. There's a leopard wood. Uh, right there. Yeah, right there. Um, there's lots of great, particular back and side woods that you can make a great guitar out of, and that's one of the things that's changed over the years. Um, yeah, that's appropriately named leopard yeah. wood. <laughs> um. <clears throat> And to be honest with you, we had to look up where leopard wood was grown. And what did, what did you come up with uh, before we came over South here? South America. Yeah, South America. <laughs> we knew that all along. Yeah. <laughs> not built with it, but just a couple of The Paduk was uh, African, I think. Yeah. Um, but there's there's tons of stuff like that out there. But for years, you, you know, we, we couldn't give stuff like that away 25 years ago. Uh, so that... People have worked around the edges of it a little bit, you know, where you, you get a few sets out there and somebody's like, oh, that did, really did make a really good guitar. And, and um, it sort of gains acceptance. And nowadays with the Internet, that's a lot easier because, you know, the Internet being a two-edged sword that it is, it's a, there's a lot of really good information passed between guitar owners. There's also a lot of total crap that's, <laughs> that's out there that... Don't believe everything. Don't believe everything. <laughs> believe everything you read, wow. but that's one of the positive things that's come out of it. Is is the, it's so easy to spread the word now, and somebody will say, "Well, you know, I bought a, you know, uh, a Coca Cola. I bought a Paduk guitar. I bought a something made out of Pau Ferro, and it was incredible." <clears throat> and so they're like, "Oh, they're willing to look for that." They come into Larry's store, and that thing is hanging in here. Like, I believe I'll give us a chance, you know. So that's. That's one of the real innovations that's happening, way more than any kind of design for somebody like us, uh, is just building out of different things. And then the, <coughs> excuse me, the thermo-cured woods came along uh, about 12 years ago, probably we got into it. 
first year, we started <coughs> working with uh, Thermic for Red Spruce. Red Spruce, a lot of you guys call it adolescent sexual happening. Yeah. That's the process of making the resin out of it. We all know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, not to go too deep on that, but it's done at a vacuum at sort of a low temperature, and and it bakes the resins out and sort of sort of pre ages the the top. Um, we got into it early on, uh, and now you know everybody's into it now because it makes a great sounding guitar. It, it sort of it sort of starts the aging process. Um, it's a little tricky. I mean, for a little while. It was a little tricky because there were some of the suppliers who, who bake some of it too much, and if you do that, it makes it unstable. Really? Um, we, but they figured out pretty quickly. You know, this is this is where it's, this has got to stop, or else uh, we're going to have some trouble here. <clears throat> you had to figure out how to glue a bridge onto it and make it stick, uh, which um, it is still more susceptible to bridges coming off. But we've made great strides, and everybody else has too. And figuring out how to make that work, uh, but what the positive side and both of my personal guitars are thermo cure. They this one's thermo cure. Yeah, that one is too. <coughs> it just speeds speeds up the aging process and just makes it sound drier to start with. Um, and yes, we still use Brazilian rosewood. It's yeah. hard to come by though. Hard source and very expensive, but still building. We've gotten a lot, uh, just in the last few years, we've gotten a lot of small private collections approaching us of saying, I've got this wood in my garage. I thought I was going to build guitars, and I built one in 1970, and I never made any more. And so we've had the opportunity to purchase a few private collections like that, and I think that's kind of where some of the really hard-to-find things, the future is kind of heading a little bit, because some of the, the Brazilian rosewood you can find now is not that great, honestly, and it's insanely expensive like our cost is crazy high and we're just not willing to pay for that necessarily with something we don't feel is going to make a quality guitar just because it says brazilian rosewood so we've been approached a few times of the guys like i've got three top or three backs that i've been hanging on to i'm that he reaches out to us for whatever reason they like us or whatever and so that's been kind of fun to pick through some collections like that and get some wood that's been air dried for 50 years just sitting there waiting for waiting for us to come along we didn't know it some of that stuff feels a little more like a back alley drug deal. Than, I know. Than, <laughs> they show up in the parking lot with their <laughs> yeah. trunk and they open it up and we go out there and look. And no. can, yeah, we did offer them cash on the spot for a few tops or whatever. I, well, I literally went to, uh, when we were here at the show a few years ago and Morrow still, Morrow had some sets in the trunk of his car and we went <laughs> out to back We out. went out to the, to the parking garage and he raised the trunk and I was like, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> It, it gets it gets a little icky on some of that stuff. But yeah. It's not like it's illegal. Um, it's all paperwork covered. In. Yeah, and and in fact, we even have a CITES permit to ship it overseas, but we don't off we don't ever do it because the the regulations overseas. You can ship it overseas, and they get the paperwork, and they don't know what it means. Yeah, it's a risk. Sometimes you know because everybody's yeah regs are different. It's not worth losing a Brazilian guitar over. No. Hey, Scott, you were going to do that Deep River Blues, I believe, a while ago. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. I think I'm pretty loud. Okay. That's okay. A um, couple of questions. Um, recommended string gauges? Uh, just medium on everything. Our small bodies, we, our small bodies lights, you know, 1254 on smaller body things. Our double O's and single O's. We put a label in that say light only, because there we do three different sizes of an X brace, um, and the the O's and double O's have a, a style three X brace, which in our system means it's the lightest one, and really should only ever be um, light gauge twelve, nothing heavier than a fifty four on those, but everything else is. You could put, you know, 56s on. Okay. And do you recommend any pickup in particular for your instruments? We we like K&K. &K, um, really, uh, on the acoustics, we like K&K &K, uh, for several reasons. And it, it doesn't work in every application. If you play somewhere, if you're playing with bass and drums, you're playing bar jobs, <clears throat> that type pickup I don't think is, you, you can, uh, under saddle transducer, 
doesn't sound as good, but you can get more gain out of. But for for most of us, the way we'll want to plug in, it has a more natural sound. It sounds better. There's way less stuff inside the body. I really, I don't mind at all guitar being plugged up. I've got pickups in both my guitars, but I, I hate all the stuff. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> the battery and um, preamps inside and all that stuff. I like the K&K, the simplicity, the three little uh, pads comes back and and then just use a preamp outside the body, something sitting on the floor. Um, but everybody, you know, there are some great pickups out there. LR bags, Fishman, there's, there's tons of good pickups out there. That's just one that's inexpensive and uh, mine's an LR. I like the LR bags lyric. It's the ones I like, and it's. I mean, it's. It. I usually have a pedal board I plug into, but it works just plug. It works just plugged into a direct box as well. So you know, I mean, it does have a battery, and it's got a preamp in the end jack. Yeah, take all yeah. that crap out of there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you desecrated our guitar. That <laughs> I may have put it in there myself. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I put, I put okay, it. I, put I that installed one in. it. <laughs> for uh, for electrics, uh, we're we're partnered up with Lindy Fralin um, for the humbuckers. Um, <clears throat> we're just now going to transition and doing some P90s, uh, but so far we've been all humbuckers on our electrics. And Lindy's shop is only about an hour and a half <clears throat> east of us. He's a great resource for us, too. He, yeah. He knows everything about vintage pickups. Pick and, yeah. yeah. He's a genius. His P90s are the best, I yeah. think. <laughs> Super nice guy. And when, you know, when we got into this, I called him up. He knew who we were. And, and, um, and I said, you know, we're going to do some electrics, and we need, we need a little guidance on pickups. And he said, well, come on down. You know, we'll, we'll play some stuff. And so we went down to, to okay. his, his shop, and his office has just got, it, it looks like this place with guitars hanging up there, but they've all got a bunch of different, you know, every configuration of single coil or humbuck or, you know, everything you can think of in, in uh, you know, coil splits and, and every way you can wire them up and everything. And he just spent a lot of time with us and um, has been a really great resource. And if we want to do something, you know, oddball, we can call him up and say, you know, how could we make this work? And, and he helps us to figure that out. So, um, he's he's great in that regard. Question? Yeah, Larry. Right. It's on. Okay, so I love acoustic guitars. Obviously, like many of us here, I love the way they sound. I love playing them. I love the way they feel. But I also love the aesthetics of them. And there's a true artistry that goes into building your instruments. I mean, I'm just looking at the top row of guitars on the wall behind you there, and I see so much uh, artistry and I'm wondering who's the artist in the group hmm. and where does your inspiration come from for the different inlays and the types of bursts and you know we've got the transparent black and the different types of bursts and the, Brian uh, is uh, uh, yeah Brian's the best artist I think uh, in the shop he can we he just recently drew a new inlay he he drew the he drew the the inlay that I think is the best we ever had that was original, uh, and that was our 10th anniversary vine. Yeah. Brian drew that when he worked for us way back then. Um, and um, and he, he's, he's a great artist. He, um, his mother is an artist. She, she paints. Is. She is. Yeah. And so... Um, hey, Cindy. But we collaborate on stuff like that. You know, we'll, we'll come up with something. We'll... You know, and we'll draw it in uh, in CAD, and and then we'll print it out and say, does this, you know, does this look original, and does this look nice, you know? And then we'll say, yeah, it looks original, but it's clunky as hell, you know. Yeah. Starting, and, <laughs> and we'll we'll go. Right. And, and I've I've learned a lot about uh, finish work and sunburst, which you know we're biased, but I think we do some of the best sunburst in the business. Mm, absolutely, <clears throat> Mark. Uh, Used to own, well, his father owned a body shop and paint, and so he he knew that world inside and out, and brought it over <laughs> to the guitar world, and has taught me. And I'm now doing most of the sunbursts 
uh, transition over from Mark. And it's just, uh, it's part of the fun. It is the artistry. Like I, I actually, I really enjoy spraying sunburst and, and I like the fact that we get to do each one different, you know, even what we have up here are all different. That's just two colors instead of three, you know, we got, well, maybe we all would do is do three. No, we got two, three colors here. You know, there's a bunch of different patterns you can do and things like that. It, it is a, a bit of a, the few things that, you know, aren't standardized per se. You get to go into the booth and, you know, hopefully lay it on correctly the first time and, and get to do a little bit of art. Yeah. So that, 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 that's fun. Yeah. It's really hard to, it's really hard to do a sunburst and then, and make make any two look alike, which is kind of a cool thing, actually, if you think about it. Because and we're not the only ones. Because I can look around this room and see some of our competitors' bursts that are cool and look good, but they don't necessarily look exactly like another mm -hmm. one that they might do. And um, <clears throat> that's that's one of the great things about it. I can look at one and tell whether I did it or Brian. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I always I, I always thought that I'd worked at it a long time and got to be good at it and. Uh, because for a long time I was not good at it. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so Brian came in. I said, man, look, you know, this is one of the things that you need to take over. He had done some yeah, back in the day. A while ago. And uh, when he worked for us before. And I said, you, you need to take this over. I'm I'm done with that. I'm not going to do it anymore. So he went in and started doing it. I gave him a few pointers, but he was pretty much dead on it. And so now the other day I was in the shop and – one of the guys, the guy that does the fret work, and Kim were in there, and I could hear him talking. And Brian had been gone, and I had done a couple of bursts. And I could hear the two of them talking, saying, uh, man, that's a beautiful burst. And I went in there thinking with my chest kind of puffed out. But as soon as I got in there, I could tell he did it. <laughs> it's a tickle burst. <laughs> like, damn it, it is pretty, and I didn't do it. So. You've done some pretty ones, too. I have done some pretty ones. I've done some pretty ugly ones, too, but it's been a long time <laughs> yeah. since I did a really hideous Absolutely. one. It's one of the hardest things to do. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be. It doesn't look like it would be, but it is. There's no margin for error. To do a really nice one. Yeah. yeah. Scott, how about that Deep River Blues? You said you'd do that for, we were talking about Oh, Do sure. We were talking about Doc play earlier. With me? You want to play uh, with no, me? No, I won't play with you. Yeah, you do it. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'll put it up in there. Okay. This is an old Doc mainstay. I, I, this is probably Mississippi John Hurt or somebody. No, does. it was actually the Delmore brothers. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, the Delmore brothers actually were regional to us as well in the Carolinas. And, um, you know, they had two guitars. And when Doc heard um, uh, Merle Travis play, you know, Kentucky Thumb Picker, and he figured, man, I, I, if I could learn to do that, I could learn to play both the Delmore Brothers parts on at, at the same time on one guitar. So, you know, and, and sometimes they called it Big River Blues, I think, instead of Deep River Blues. But, um, but Doc did that, and uh, it's become a really popular song of that, you know, probably one of Doc's most famous songs. And um, and this would have been his March third of this year would have been his hundredth the hundredth anniversary of his birth. So um, you see a lot of Doc at one hundred shows going around. I don't know if you see him Which out here. Did. On, I did. Yes. I don't know if you see him out here on the West Coast or not. But Billy Strings and all kinds of folks have been doing Doc at one hundred shows. You know. Molly Tuttle. Ollie Tuttle, right, and um, a lot of folks back home, you know, and Doc's old bandmates, Jack Lawrence and uh, T. Michael Coleman, they've been doing some. So anyway, I'll try a little bit of the Deep River Blues. And uh, any NASCAR fans in here? Oh, you got one. Well, I always tell people if I mess up, that's for the people that like to go to NASCAR crash races to watch the crashes. <laughs> So if I crash and burn, that's 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 for you guys. I'd like to give a little something for everybody. So here's uh, my little take on Deep River Blues. He 
You can let it rain, you can let it pour Let it rain a whole lot more I got these deep river blues Let the rain drive right on You can let the waves sweep along Cause I got these deep old river blues My old gal, she's a good old pal she looks just like a waterfowl. I get in deep river blues. Won't nobody cry for me, and all the fish go out now on the spree. Cause I got these deep old river You can give me back my old boat Hey, I'm gonna sail now if she'll float I got them deep river blues If my boat sinks with me You know I'll go down now, don't you see Cause I got these deep old river blues And you can let it rain, you can let it pour In deep river blues Let the rain drive right on You can let the waves sweep along Cause I got these deep old river Honey, are you, you got anything else you wanted to share with the people? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, nothing really happens until it gets on Facebook, right? So uh, <laughs> I guess it's all on Facebook tonight anyway, yeah. isn't it? Uh, one, one thing I'd like to say about Larry and, and Debbie and their store here is, um, it's a, it, he's a great guy. We, we haven't dealt with him very long. But you can sort of tell we've been around it long enough uh, to say this is a real person. This is a person we want to do business with. And so he's that kind of guy. This is that kind of store. And I think he's going to do great because there's not a lot of high end, even in a place, you know, the L.A. area here. It's just not, it's not on every corner. It's not in every mile. You know, you have the big boxes, but they don't really do what we do. They don't. We build 200 guitars a year. They're not interested in selling uh, what piece of 200 we could give them. <laughs> they, they probably have 200 stores. I couldn't give them but one guitar a year, you know. But anyway, support Larry and, and what he does here. Really appreciate the fact that you came tonight and were part of this uh, because he's a great guy and this store is going to be here and, it, and it, there's going to be some terrific instruments passed through here. And uh, so anyway... Thank you, Larry. We yeah. appreciate it a lot. Um, so anyway, are there any more questions uh, before we we can wrap Rick. up? Rick. Yeah, you got to get the mic, Rick. It's not an official question until it goes on Facebook, like I said. All right, I got the mic. All right. <laughs> so you mentioned the uh, thermo-cured tops and all. I'm curious... If you all have looked in at all to the uh, vibration type frequency things like the, I believe, tone right, do and what your feelings on those uh, type of things are? Well, 
we've never um, we've never ourselves experimented with it. We've heard that it does terrific things. In fact, we Brian just was had a somebody. Customer yeah, just had one. That he put a tone right on it, and I mean, it, I, I guess that it's yeah. sound yeah. science because it's the same thing as if you sat there and played it over and over every day for however long that would take you to do. Which is the method we encourage more. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The, uh, Get to know your guitar. The old fish aquarium, uh, what, what was it? The, in the, original, the, the original version of that was like the... Uh, fish the, tank. Yeah, you know, the, the fish the pump, the pump the vibrator on there, yeah. Uh, that's, that, that would be a little more my redneck version of it. I guess. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, before that, people used to say, put your transistor radio on yeah, in your guitar case yeah. and just leave it, just let, it play, let it play in your, yep. you know. Oh, there, you know, in our neck of the woods now, Scott Ford will tell you about this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the old fiddle players, the old time fiddle players in the mountains of, of, of Virginia and places such as that, you know what I'm going to say to you. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's the rattle off a rattlesnake. That's what's yeah, in Scott's guitar. Yeah, you got rattlesnake guitar. rattlers in your yeah. guitar. They put them in all the fiddles. I mean, you dropped them in the <clears throat> the f hole of your fiddle, and um, now that's We're not quite that hillbilly. Yeah, well, I, I he's got him. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I think I worked on your guitar for something. Not, you, you did not too long ago, and I, for the longest time, I was like, "Man, there's just this weird buzz. I cannot figure out what." <laughs> I look in there, and there's a rattlesnake around. I was like, "Oh, that was it." That's a little more. <laughs> that's a little more mountain juju than what I'm comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, a, and 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 you kill the snake and eat the snake, and then you skin it out and use the the hide for your hat band. Oh yeah! Put the rattle, rattle. on the guitar. And rattle for your guitars. That's right. <laughs> we where we come from, we use we use every part of the pig, <laughs> but the squeal, as we like to say. Um, but I don't I don't see anything wrong with the science to answer your question. Except there's a lot of things that um, I don't know if I could hear it. Honestly, I don't know how long you'd have to leave it on there before I could hear it. Sometimes you can just feel when a guitar's opened up, though, like Brian said, sometimes they open up pretty quickly, and that could do it. It could wake one up. I don't, I don't really have a problem with people. It comes down to playing. <clears throat> yeah. You got to play it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you buy it, to play it. So if you play it, if you play it every day, you're going to get that, you know, and bang on it. You're going to get that same kind of, you know, the same effect, I think, better. You're going to get more of that effect than just sticking a aquarium pump in your guitar, you know. Yeah, there's nothing. And not to mention the fact that when your playing gets better, all of a sudden your guitar sounds a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, whatever, you're, whatever, whatever, kind of, whatever kind of hobby people are into, sometimes you think, um, if I get a new guitar... It's going to make my playing a lot better, and it, it's. If you get a Hudson do Dalton, that. it will. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I think it encourages you to play more. And, yeah. You know, like it, I'm way into bicycles, so like I buy a new bike. Next thing I know, I'm riding that bike all the time because you know. It's like when you get yeah. new tennis shoes when you're a kid, you can always jump higher exactly. and run faster. It, I think it encourages you to pick up that guitar more often when you have something nice that you enjoy playing. So, but for, if you get a Hudson Dalton, you will play better. Yeah, probably at least five per, at least five percent guaranteed. For for me, it's it's mules. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm into work mules. That's the thing that I've a hobby that I have, and I always think, <clears throat> you know, that the next the next pair. Uh, that I buy is going to be the ones that are really going to put me up at the top with the old time mule men. But uh, <laughs> come to find out, it's in what you know and not yep. not the next pair of mules. Same thing with a guitar. Uh, we 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 use them on the farm a little bit, uh, for, and then yeah, we have wagons. We give wagon you rides. Pl you plow with them. Plow, too. yeah, yeah. some and raise. We raise our garden. When we raise a big garden, we we use pretty much all animal power to do that and now our mothers are now we're raising our mothers. yeah we're we're Plus we're our yeah our mothers are old and health failing so we there's a little bit of less of that that we do but that's that's our hobby brian rides brian gets off from work every other night we went out to dinner and 
we'd worked all day long and it was not a real easy day. And we went out with them. And it was 85 degrees. Yeah. On top of and, that, and, and you know, 400 mile bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> Kim said, how, in where you can. Kim said, how far did you go today? He said, I, I just did 18 miles. I was like, holy cow, 18 miles. I can't imagine riding a bike 18 miles, but anyway. Yeah, we all got our hobbies. Larry, did you have something? Yeah, oh, oh, first a comment uh, about whether a guitar can make you a better player. I, I do think that certain guitars can be sources of inspiration for making oh, yeah. music. I mean, I find it sometimes I'll pick up a different guitar and I'll find myself playing something that I wouldn't play in other guitars, you know, that I didn't know where it came from. So I, I do think that a new guitar can make you a better player. Yeah. It can certainly you inspire you to write one. different kinds of music, Absolutely. right? Yeah. But my question was this. I know that you used to build banjos, correct? Right. Do you have any plans to return to that or any other instruments, arch tops, mandolins, anything else that you think you might at some point want to build? Right. <laughs> well, we... Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong key. Um, we we did we did stop building banjos. Jeff Huss and I both started as banjo builders for Stelling Banjo. Uh, that was the first Luthery gig we had. Um, we both worked there, and of course, Stelling started out here uh, in Southern California, and then moved to Virginia in uh, 1984. And Jeff Huss was just getting out of law school in, in 1984 and um, decided that the world didn't need any more lawyers, it needed more banjos. So I thought that's probably debatable too. <laughs> <laughs> Did he pass law school? He, uh, in two states. He passed the bar okay. in two states yeah, and then, then decided he didn't want to be a lawyer. So, But anyway, uh, we... We love banjos. Jeff Huss and I both banjo players. We just, we just love it's in it's in my blood, um, and he's from North Dakota. But for some reason, it got in his blood. I don't know, but we love them. But there there was first of all the, that market has shrunk some, and second of all, we never made all the metal parts that make up a banjo. And when you buy, we we make almost all of this. And when you buy parts, then it's harder to make money at it. And um, once we got into the electric guitar thing, we thought, um, let's go this direction for a while. I can't say we won't ever make any more banjos, but not immediately. Other things, it is a lot going to be up to him. What do yeah, you, what do you mean, want to make, Brian? Probably expand the electric lines, of course. I was an electric bass player, so that's not out of the question that someday a bass might show up. I'm really intrigued by archtop guitars. Who knows? But yeah. Probably not banjos. Probably not. My wife, Mary Beth, would love me to make banjos, but... Probably not mandolins. Probably not mandolins, no. But yeah, so that's, that's future yeah, possible. Yeah. You're getting in bagpipes? I can, I'll research it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a musical instrument, we thought we could sell a few of them. We, we, you know, we'd probably give it a shot. Yeah. But we try to stay away from stuff that we don't know a whole lot about. I, I love I love mandolins. I love the sound of a mandolin. I, you know, again, you know, Sam Bush, so somebody like that, just ultimate hero for for somebody like me. But um, I don't play mandolin, so I'm not sure that I would know a really good one if we built it. You know, um, I can play a little guitar, so I can tell if it's a good guitar or not. You know, yeah. so we tend to stay away from stuff that we think we might not be able to do. You can't do everything, you know, so yeah. you just sort of have to pick and choose. Um, so anyway, well, Scott, you want to play another one before we call it an evening? Sure, I can do that. I think we're going to um, maybe have some more snacks. or Yeah, um, just real quick. Thank you all for taking your time to come out tonight. I know some of you are a couple hours away, so appreciate the support. We really do appreciate it. <laughs> support your local guitar shop, your Huss and Dalton guitar shop. Um, and reach out to us. You can go to our website, and you'll either get me, usually it's me, that will answer your email, or Brian. Mark's or, not too... Or reach out to Larry. That's right. Yeah. And after the, after the show here, we'll clear the stage, and you'll... Can... Check out. Yeah, it's unusual to have fourteen Hudson Daltons in one room. We don't yeah, even really have that is. at our shop. We, it's wonderful. We, sh we ship them out 
generally the day that it's they're finished. To see so these, yeah, check them out. He's hanging here, and of course we're taking eight over to the show tomorrow. So yeah, but we'll bring some of them back to you. <laughs> um, so before Scott plays, everybody, uh, let's do a little. Everybody wave. Yay. Yeah, this is good. Thank You're you. going to see yourself on Facebook. <laughs> You're a somebody. Thanks so much. Thanks to our Facebook uh, recorder. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie, a Sorry lot. Yeah. All right, Did what you going to play, Scott? Uh, I'll flat pick another one. Okay. Mm. Try. What are you going to do? I might come back you up. I don't have a pick. You got a pick, Larry? Yeah. Everybody, everybody's got a pick in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you got a range. Who's got a pick? What's that? What are you going for? Cherokee shuffle? Everybody's digging. It's like, oh, my God. Who can pick their picks the fastest? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I need uh, What you need? Capo. Oh. What's that? Why not? It's one of those everyday carry kits, you know, you, you never leave home without a capo or guitar picks or thumb picks or... Rattlesnake tail and a guitar? Yeah. Never know. That that, that's one of those things that goes in every guitar and a capo goes on every guitar so you never lost without it. Okay. I'm not sure where you get the rattle. I don't think Larry sells the rattlesnake rattle. <laughs> go to Texas, you can buy it. <laughs> Let's try this um, again. If I crash and burn, it's for all you guys, NASCAR fans. <laughs> Thank you all a lot for coming and hope to meet Thank all you. of you before you go.
And I just want to say before we say goodnight, thank you so much, Kimberly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brian. Where'd Brian go? <laughs> oh, you're right in front of me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, you guys absolutely. are absolutely terrific. You know, Hudson Dalton was the very first uh, contract that I signed as a dealer. Yes. And I'm so appreciative that you brought me on to be part of the family. I mean, the guitars sell themselves. I've sold a bunch of them. They're and so they will make you sell. better players. They'll make you better <laughs> players. We've got some beautiful ones on the wall. So, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, you guys, so much. Have a great night. Yeah.